Real estate investing can seem really complicated, but in this video, I make it super simple. So if you are just starting out, this is the video for you. It is a super simple video to follow along with. And by the end of it, you are going to go, oh my gosh, how come nobody has ever explained it like that before? So stay tuned all the way until the end, and I hope you enjoy. All right, welcome to the first course. This is going to be the basics of real estate investing. This is going to be minimal edits, but it is going to be really jam-packed full of useful information if you are just getting started in real estate investing. All right, so let's talk about the three main ways to make money in real estate investing, and that is wholesaling, flipping, or holding. So wholesaling, this one right here, this is where you get a property under contract and then you sell the contract. You do not have to buy the property. You do not have to have any money. All you have to do is talk to a seller and then get them get them to agree to sell you the property, get the property under contract. That's what I mean by getting it under contract. They agree to sell you the property and then you find somebody who actually wants to buy the property and then they will buy the property, right? So you're not actually the buyer. So that's wholesaling. Okay, so now fix and flip or here, flip. First, you gotta buy the property, right? And then you fix up the property and then you sell it for more. So let's say you buy the property for $100,000 and you fix it up for $50,000, and then later on you sell it for $250,000. Right there, you make $100,000 minus fees. So let's say your fees are $20,000. So here you've made $80,000. So that's fix and flip. And then finally, we got buy and hold. So buy and hold is simply you get the property, you buy the property, right? And then you dump a whole bunch of money into it. And then what happens is you get rent over time. And so that's pretty simple. Now, the thing is that you have to focus on is the fact that uh, in, in addition to rent, in addition to you getting rent, uh, there will be expenses, right? So money's going to go into your pocket, but then your money's going to leave your pocket in terms of expenses. Those expenses are going to be uh, utilities, taxes, insurance, maintenance, management, all those kind of things. So just bear in mind that you're gonna have costs to holding the property. So just because you can buy a property doesn't mean that it's gonna make a good rental. So you have to double check to make sure that the rent coming in is going to be greater than the expenses going out, right? So rent going in your pocket is greater than the expenses going out of your pocket, which is pretty common sense if you think about it because we're in the business of making money. So if we are not making money, then what are we doing? So Hold, buy and hold here. That is where you're going to have cost to hold the property, but hopefully you're renting it for more than all of your costs. Fixing and flipping, you're going to actually buy the property and then you're going to then fix it up and sell it. And then uh, with wholesaling, a lot of people like wholesaling because it doesn't require any money. You get a property under contract and then you sell the contract. So plain and simple, but I'm going to break down these a little further. All right, let's talk about wholesaling. So there you are in the middle. And what you're going to be doing is you're going to find someone who's looking to sell the property. That's the person on the left there. And so let's say that the person on the left has this house. And this house they want to sell for $100,000. And you talk to them and you say, hey, I would love to buy your house. And then they say, okay, it's $100,000. Let's say you both both agree to that for the sake of this this. Um, example here, right? And so what happens is there is between you two something called an agreement of sale. So this agreement of sale will say how much you guys are agreeing to do the transaction for and that's $100,000. And then it's going to have things like the address of the property, right? It's going to have the address of the property, the date you guys are going to close, and uh, the buyer and seller name. So buyer and seller name. So things like that, right? So so now you've locked it up, right? You have this contract and there is value in this contract if you do this right. And what I mean by that is next thing you're going to do is you're going to go find a buyer and you say, hey, buyer, I know that you like to invest in this area. So how about this? I found this property. Let me send it to you. You take a look, right? And so they take a look and they go, oh, I love it. How much? And that's when you tell them like, oh, I would love to sell it to you for $120,000. And they go, okay, that sounds like a good price to me. So then what's happening is you are doing another contract and it's called an assignment contract. Assignment contract. And essentially 
what you're doing is you're assigning this first piece of paper, this agreement of sale, you're assigning the rights for the buyer to change, right? So you're no longer the buyer, you were the buyer, but now you're assigning the right with an assignment contract to this new buyer. Let's call this new buyer, buyer A, okay? So now over here, you're changing it from you, right? So from you to A, buyer A. So that's what's happening here. So you make $20,000 when they go to closing. And here's how it looks. At the day of closing, at the day of closing, what happens is the buyer will go get a check for $120,000 and depending on the state that you're in, but it could be where, let's say that there's a title company. The title company is the third party company that does all of the transactions. So the title company will handle everything. The buyer will bring a check for 120,000. Now, mind you, there's no fees and stuff. I don't want to complicate this too much, but $120,000 goes to the title company. They kick you your $20,000 and then the seller gets their $100,000 and the buyer just bought the house. And there you go, you just made $20,000. So the question is, how much did you spend here? And the answer is nothing, because all it was was a piece of paper. Now, technically, I guess you had to buy the paper and all that kind of stuff, but you can do it digitally as well. I've done, I've done these kind of contracts all for my cell phone or my iPad and had the seller sign right there, right there, right in front of me on my cell phone or iPad with, with the pencil. So that you can do for very little money, that contract that you now hold, that has value, and then you sell the value of it to the next person, the assignment of 120. And now, why is buyer A, why is buyer A buying the property? Well, it's because they wanna be a fix and flipper or they want to be a landlord and rent the property out, which is going to be our next examples. All right, we're back. Here's our friend, buyer A, who owns that house. Remember, let's go over the numbers. They bought it for $120,000. And in this example, we're going to say that they are going to spend $50,000 in repairs. Okay, $50,000 in repairs. And the purchase price, the purchase price was $120,000. Everybody's following along so far. That's pretty easy. So now this is $170,000. All in so far, right? so far. So I'm not even going to write all in here. I was going to write all in here, but I'm not going to do that. So instead of writing all in there, what I'm going to do is show you the other fees that you have to be aware of. So the question is, where does this money come from, right? Where does that money come from? So if you guys are a part of my education program, then you guys know that I always talk about different ways of financing the property. You can use credit cards, you can use lines of credit, right? I'll write it down, credit cards and lines of credit, and you can use the bank, you can use a hard money loan you can use private money loans uh what else you can of course use cash you can bring in a partner uh what what else oh of course you can use like a self-directed ira um, you could even do seller financing which we didn't do in this example seller financing you can also take over a property subject to but the 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 way you finance it is almost endless, almost endless. So let's just keep it real basic. Let's keep it real basic, real simple. Uh, let's say we are going to hyper-focus on, let's go private money lending, okay? That's the simplest one to be aware of. So somebody in your network is going to lend you the $170,000, okay? So this person is going to lend you $170,000. And then what do you think they want in return? And the answer is, of course, more money. So if they lend you 170, let's pretend like they say, hey, if I lend you the 170, I want $20,000 in interest. Okay, great. So let's factor that in, $20,000 in interest. Interest. Okay, so $120,000 in interest. And then what else do we have to keep in mind? Well, while you hold the property, there's going to be property taxes, property insurance. You might have a security system. You might have to pay for some utilities and all that kind of stuff while you do the repairs. Okay, so that's going to run you, let's say, $5,000. And let's call that holding cost. Okay, so where are we at now? So 
we are all in so far for a hundred and ninety five thousand dollars fantastic so looking good so far okay i want you guys to focus on this little thing selling method what do i mean by that well when you go to sell this property how are you going to sell it are you going to sell it on your own or are you going to hire a real estate agent so the reason why this matters is because one is free, right? This one is free, obviously. And then the other one costs money. So how much money, do you say, or ask? Typically between 5 and 6% paid for by the seller. So at $195,000, at 6%, so let's say $195,000 times 6%, we have... $11,700 that is going to be paid to the real estate agents that assist with this transaction. So good good chunk of change, right? So when you sell it from 195, you're not going to get that whole amount. And then in addition to that, when you go to sell the property, the person buying the property most likely, not always, but most likely, they're going to get an inspection. And when they get the inspection, what happens is they find stuff that is broken, needs to be repaired, or given a credit to repair the things. So let's say in this case, they we're going to anticipate that they find $3,300 in repairs. That in, either you're going to fix it yourself, which is going to cost money, you're going to hire somebody, it's going to cost money, or you're just going to give them a credit, which is going to cost money. So we're going to budget $3,300, which means that our total sales cost or from the selling method, right? It's going to be $15,000. So that is the commissions, which is that. Commissions plus the inspection, right? So commission plus inspections. And that's if we sold for 195. Now, <clears throat> nobody in their right mind would sell for 195 because you're all in for 195. So what does that mean? You have to ask yourself, how much do you want to make in profit? So that is the number one question and probably what you need to start with. How much money do you actually want to make based on how much effort all of this is going to take? Hey guys, I hope you are getting a lot of value from this video. And if you are, imagine what it'd be like if you worked with me directly and you get that opportunity. If you are interested in learning how to wholesale, fix and flip, buy and hold, do syndications, do apartment buildings, do self-storage facilities, and anything in between, get with me. Go to honezone.com slash apply, and let's see how we can work together. Now back to the video. All right, so let's work this backwards. So let's say that you were interested in selling the property for $300,000. And you should know this number before you get started, right? You need to know what you can possibly sell the property for based on what other properties in the area are selling for. So if you were selling a property for $300,000, a 6% commission is going to be $18,000, believe it or not. And then let's just say that the repairs, when the person who buys it, when they, the repairs that you're going to have to do is going to be $2,000, just to keep things simple, right? And I say simple as in math, math simple. So here we have $280,000. So far, so good. You guys understand that? I subtracted that 18 and the 2,000. So we're at 280. And then our all in from over here, right, that 195. We go and we subtract that. Oops, sorry. 280 minus 195. And when you do the math here, a little subtraction, the answer is $85,000. So now you have to ask yourself the question, the profit that you wanted to make from doing a fix and flip is $85,000 enough. Right? And a lot of you guys will say yes, and some of you guys will say no, and it really depends on how much work is going to be, be required to do this deal. So in this case, the fix and flip person stands to make $85,000 in profit. Right? If you guys remember from before, in our wholesaling example, you made $20,000. So you made $20,000, the buyer, buyer A, they made $85,000, but notice, 
they took on a lot more risk because they won. They had to borrow $170,000 with $20,000 in interest and all those kind of things, right? And there's no guarantee that we're going to sell for $300,000. Maybe the market changes. Uh, maybe a lot of bad things happen where, like, instead of a $50,000 rehab budget, maybe it goes to $80,000 or $90,000 or $110,000. And you see how quickly this profit erodes? So it's $85,000 if everything goes smoothly and it sells for the $300,000. The repairs stay at $50,000. So you might initially gut reaction say, man, I should have been the fix and flipper because I got to make $85,000 instead of $20,000. But the, the fix and flipper is taking on a whole bunch more risk. And so that risk needs to get paid. And there you go, $85,000 for that risk seems fair. Also, the fix and flipper, they might have been in the deal for, let's say, I don't know, anywhere from six to 12 months, right? Whereas over here in this, you did this in two weeks. So you got $20,000 in two weeks versus $85,000 in six to 12 months. And you took on a whole bunch of risks because the market could change and your repairs could be wrong. And you might not find a private money lender at $20,000. Maybe they want $25,000 or $30,000 or whatever. So a lot of different risk factors that you take on. So you really have to figure out where, where is your comfort zone. All right, our next example is the buy and hold. So let's say buyer A, instead of buying it to flip it, he decided to buy this to be a rental. And let's keep everything the same just for the sake of ease, right? So we all know about the purchase price and the rehab and all that kind of stuff. And he got the money from the private money lender, $20,000 in interest, $5,000 in holding, all the same, okay? So the only difference is that now, instead of selling the property, he is going to be renting this property out to somebody who pays him rent. So now let's see if this deal works. So let's say <clears throat> that this rent is going to be $2,000 a month. And let's take a look at all of the expenses that this person has to keep in mind. So right here, we have $300 of taxes, insurance, utilities, maintenance, management. When you add all of that up, that's 300, 400, 450, uh, 550, 650, seven, 800. Okay, so we have $800 per month in expenses. So then if you do the math, very simple, you just subtract it all, uh, what we have left is $1,200 a month. So that sounds pretty good, but let's see. There's one big thing that we're leaving out. So let's say that we have to go get a loan for this property. I need you guys to be aware of something. So we talked about this PML. So that's private money lender, right? Private MIA. Let me do this real quick. So we have our private money lender, right? The private money lender is only lending it to us for let's say 12 months. They're not in this deal for a long time. So 12 months is the duration of the loan and they want to be paid $20,000 at the end of 12 months. So the question is how, if we're going to hold this property for years and years and years, how do we pay them back? And the answer is we get a bank loan. Getting a bank loan is going to be the key to paying off the private money lender. Let's take a look at how it actually works. So if you guys recall, the value of the property was $300,000. When you go to the bank and you tell them, hey, I own a property for $300,000, they're gonna say, okay, great. We can give you a loan on that property. And typically the loan is going to be 70 to 75% of the value. So in this case, a $300,000 value at 70% is $210,000. So $210,000 is going to be the loan amount, right? And so that's how you're going to be paying back your private money lender and all of the holding costs, interest costs, and all that kind of stuff. So if you notice that the, the $210,000 is actually more than the one ninety five dollars that you're all in, so in this case, it looks like you're going to be pocketing $15,000. Now, of course, when you get your bank loan, there's going to be costs like appraisals and, 
and points and origination and legal and yada 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 right but let's just say that you get to pocket the fifteen thousand dollars but now you have a two hundred and ten thousand dollar bank loan now the real question is what is this bank loan going to cost you well it really depends on the the interest rate and the terms. So let's say that this was an 8% interest loan over the course of 30 years, a 30 year amortized loan, right? So 8% at 30 years, the interest, principal and interest only is going to be $1,540. So that means with this buy and hold, you lost $340 per month. Does that sound like a good deal? And most people would say no. I hope you say no as well, because that means you have negative cash flow, and that's not why we're doing it. So let's take a look at a different example. Instead of 8%, let's say we made this a 5%. So what do the numbers look like now? Well, at 5%, 30 years, we are at $1,127 per month. And so now we are positive, right? We are positive. Uh, what are we positive? 70, $73, right? $73 per month. Now, some would say like, oh my gosh, $73 a month. That doesn't sound like a lot, right? But remember, you are positive $73 per month and you put $15,000 in your pocket from the refinance, right? When we refinance. So the refinance is where you got the bank loan to pay back all of your holding costs, or I'm sorry, your private money lender plus all of the holding costs, right? So that's the refinance part. And you make an additional $73 per month. This property, if you look at it, it costs you nothing because you put this money, this $15,000 in your pocket, right? So you made money and you continue to make more money. So you put you put the $15,000 in one pocket and $73 a month in the other pocket. So now the question is, would you do this loan? Would you? I don't know, right? Would you do this loan? Some people say yay, some people say no. Now, in addition to the $73 per month, you also have something called principal pay down, right? Principal pay down because when you make your payment here, some of that goes towards principal, meaning your $210,000 loan right here, that's going down every single month. So it might start off at $210,000, but then the next month it goes down to $209,500 and $2,800 and $2,708,700 and so on and so on and so on. So you are building wealth that way as well. So in addition to the $73 a month, you are paying down the principal, which means your, your net worth is going up. And in 30 years, the house is going to be paid off completely. And let's say the house goes from value, value of $300,000. Oops. So the value goes from $300,000 all the way to say $700,000, right? In the 30 years, and you have this completely paid off. Now you own this $700,000 house free and clear. So now the question again goes back to you, would you do this deal? Also, I want you guys to consider what this is called. Uh, the slang term for this is a Burr deal, okay? And what Burr stands for is you bought it or you buy, right? Let me, let me make it thinner. Buy, renovate, reno, rent, right? Remember we rented it for two, 2000 rent and then refi. That's how we paid our private money lender back. And then we repeat and we can repeat it because we got all of our money back. We are positive. We are positive cash flow. We are positive, um, money in our pocket. So we can then go back to step one, and buy it again using private money, renovating, renting it, and then refinancing again over and over and over. And this is how you create a huge portfolio. So now that's the final question. Which one of these three are you going to do or focus on, right? Are you guys going to focus on wholesale? Are you guys going to focus on fix and flip? Or are you guys going to be buy and hold? Let me know down in the comments. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed this video.